here tonight. You know, it really doesn't matter how my day goes on a Wednesday. Once I get in here and we start singing together, I'm just so thankful to be able to worship the Lord with you guys. And I, I really mean that. It's uh, such a huge blessing. If we just did that all night, it would probably be better than what's getting ready to happen. But no, the Lord's super faithful and uh, he's just so good. And, and I love his presence. I love his presence with other people that love him. It's an honor to get to do this with all of you. So um, we're continuing in our discipleship uh, study. Um, tonight, we've been talking about the last few weeks about uh, studying the Bible uh, with purpose. One of them was faith. Um, actually, we were on faith for a couple weeks. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about studying the Bible uh, and the transformation that comes with so we look at why we study the Bible. Uh, we don't want to, like we've said many times, get into a habit of studying the Bible to know the Word, know about God, but to get to know God. This is the, the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. He knows the mind of God, and it's written, and it's available for us to know. And the ministry of the Spirit of the Lord is to illuminate the Scripture to us teach us the mind of Christ, um, to make us like him, to sanctify us, and uh, we're going to just talk about that tonight. Um, I'm going to pray for us real quick, though. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and you're so faithful, God, you're so good. I pray, Lord, that you would meet us here. As you always do, Holy Spirit, would you illuminate the Word of God to us? Would you teach us the Word of God tonight? I pray that uh, we would not come into Scripture this evening with an idea of what we think it means, but Lord, that we would just set that aside and, and we would let you reveal it to us, almost like we're reading it for the first time, God, that we wouldn't have an agenda, that we wouldn't have an ounce of pride coming into your word. Would you reveal it to us, God, that we can be like you, that we might please you. Uh, just have your way in us and be glorified in this place. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to look at James tonight to, to kind of illustrate this, this point, the Bible and transformation, studying the Bible for transformation. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been a part of a Bible study or a group, uh, and sometimes we can get into the habit of going into a study with a group of friends and leaving that saying, that was a really good Bible study, or that was a really good meeting. But are we, are we changed when we read the Word of God? Is it molding and shaping? Is it... Is it filing us down and, and hitting us with some 60 grit sandpaper here and there are we are we becoming different when we read the word of God um, it needs to be offensive to us uh, and we also need to encounter the loving kindness of God and his word and I feel like without the, the foundation of the gospel a sinner coming into contact with the holy God. The word can become a sledgehammer that we use against people. Um, it can become a high horse that we stand on or, or sit on and look down at other people. Um, but when we approach the word of God as a sinner saved by grace, it is something that we long to desire. They, it, we long for it to change us, to make us like him. Right, So I want that to be the attitude of our heart tonight, that the grace and mercy of God is so overwhelming because he died for us while we were yet sinners. So let's look at this word, like sinners saved by grace, understanding that God is so good and he is so kind, and there is no condemnation here, but it is training us up, sanctifying us to glorify him. So... Um, Let's look at scripture. I just want to mention Hebrews 4.12 to you real quick. We 
are familiar with this, but it says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible isn't merely an inanimate object. It is alive, right? It reads us. It pierces to the deepest parts of our being. It discerns our motivations. Since our God is a living God, His Word is alive, and He works through His Word to actively transform every part of our being. Uh, James uses imagery that, that I hope that we can understand or, or all understand this evening. It's, it's uh, pretty striking. Um, we're going to look at James 1, 19 through 27. If you guys have your Bibles, that's good because you're in church. If you don't, I'm not sure. I don't know how the Lord feels about that. Good luck. I know I've told you this before, but I don't know if it was Easter. It was one, one Sunday morning. We prayed, and I was coming out here, and Hunter comes up, and he's like, good luck, Dad. <laughs> Thanks. Good luck. Preach well. Okay. James 1, 19, we're going to go through 27, and we're just going to kind of look at that a little bit. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the, perf the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So James talks about a mirror, the word of God being a mirror that we look at ourselves we look into it, but the reflection is not us, it is the perfect law, it is Christ, it is the image of Christ, and he's saying if you walk away from your interaction with this word and think you're fine, you are mistaken. It's the goodness of God that gives us his word to show us where we fall short of that image, and there's not condemnation there. It says, for those who are in Christ, there is now therefore no condemnation, right? So it's the goodness of God. It's, it's his love that is, is shaping us and molding us. This isn't a reason to feel bad or leave here depressed. I know that would be unusual in my preaching if you left here feeling good about yourself, but that's the, the goal for tonight. I want you guys to Know that Jesus loves you, because um, he does, but a precept James is developing in this section of scripture, sp specifically in verse 25, or 22 through 25, is that a person who believes God's word cannot look at it as a sinner saved by grace and walk away from it without being compelled to conform to it. And if they can, then they may not be a Christian at all, and I think actually James makes it very clear that a person would not be. Um, so I want to work through these nine verses and just give us a few e examples. I want to I want to kind of do an exercise together. I want to look at the word as a mirror. Um, so let's just take this passage and, and do that. So this this book, the mirror, shows a reflection of Christ 
And he kindly and lovingly, full of grace and mercy, reveals to us where we do not look like him. Um, this is not for discouragement or humiliation, rather sanctification. I know that I just said that, but I don't want people to leave here offended by me. I want people to leave here offended by the word of God. If, if you're going to be offended, let it be by the word of God. And, and oftentimes we should be, but that offense is coming from a loving God. And it's to make you like him. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So as we go through this, I want to keep Romans 8, 1 in mind. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is not to condemn, rather to set free, right? It's for freedom that Christ set us free. So let's look at verse 19. If you do have your Bibles or a phone, it would be a good idea just to get these pulled up or open your Bible. 1 James 19. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. We'll stop there for just a second. James is already, to me, he's, he's breaking out the sandpaper. Like, I can immediately start to push up against that. Um, it says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Why? Because Jesus was slow to speak, exceedingly slow to anger, and always listening to the Father. In fact, he only spoke what he heard the Father say. Real quick, John 12, 49 and 50. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know this is his command, and I know this, and I, I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So if the scripture is a mirror of perfect law, speaking for myself, if I should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, my reflection oftentimes is generally to stop listening as soon as I disagree, quickly speak to defend myself or correct someone else. And sometimes I do that out of anger. So the word of God is a reflection of the perfect love of Christ, right? So we're looking at that and we're comparing ourselves to that. Slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to, slow to speak, slow to anger. Oftentimes, I quit listening right away. I speak far too quickly and generally it's in disagreement and out of anger. All of that is going to be motivated by pride. On Sunday mornings, we're talking about, eventually, the fruits of the Spirit. I am learning the hard way that to walk in the Spirit is to not react in the flesh at all. If I don't react with a fruit of the Spirit, I am not in step with the Spirit. So if I can get angry in my response to someone... The Spirit of God, it's not that he's not in me. He is not op I am not in step with him in that, in that interaction. And that's, that's painful because most of the time it's with people I love the most, like my wife or my children. And I can respond to you all with a smile on my face, walking in the Spirit, in step with the Spirit, and I can leave here and I can step on a Lego and I can lose my religion. I can step out of the Spirit and speak to my son in the flesh. And it's frustrating because I don't want to do that. I want to glorify God all the time. And it's not that we need to come into the word of God with this pride saying, like the rich young ruler, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. God, I'm just like you except for this little thing over here. We're talking about our creator, God. And creation does not get to argue with him. And when we submit to him and see that and he loves us so much that his gospel is true, it is not a have to in submitting to him. It is the greatest joy of our life to walk in his way, to glorify God. Right? So that's what we're talking about here. The word of God is a mirror. 
It shows us where we fall short. So the word is telling me if it is perfect, if it's perfect law and liberty, if, if freedom looks like quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, my reaction is not a behavior modification, but it's as a bond servant to Christ. Like Jesus said, I only say what the Father says. I only do what the Father does. Jesus said himself, I, I am a bond servant to my dad. I only do what I hear him say and do. I do not speak on my own authority. If God says that about God, how much more do we need to say that about the Lord? I don't speak on my own authority. I don't have an original thought. I repeat what the word of God says. Because what I think, if it contradicts what it says, I am wrong, it is right. All the time. So I want to eagerly submit to the correction of the word as it sees me. Because I know it pleases God and I don't want to be a slave to anger, but I want to be free in perfect love. I was thinking about this. I'm not easy to live with sometimes. I mean, you guys wouldn't know that. I'm pretty much the best person you all know. Which, But my wife, <clears throat> she, I mean, she's no walk in the park either. I'm just kidding. She's not here. It's okay, Amanda. Just don't tell her. Uh, no, I love my wife. She's at home pregnant. She doesn't feel very good. I'm probably, I'm probably going to spend a minute in hell for that one. That was, she's at home pregnant. Yeah. I just, I'm going to retract everything I just said about my wife. She's a saint. She puts up with me. I say things like that that I don't think about. This is the mirror. It's an ugly reflection sometimes. <laughs> I'm working out my faith in front of you. Oh, man. So let's look at verse 20. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So the word reveals impurities in us, not unto salvation, but unto sanctification. The Christian needs to look at the word this way. We've been bought by the blood of Christ. So we're not being saved through this process. We're being sanctified. We are saved. The Spirit of the Lord lives in us, and he is illuminating these things to us. It's by the Spirit of the Lord and the measure of faith that the Lord has given us that we can conform to his image in this regard. So verse 21, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. There's quite a bit here, so we'll just be here until about, until about 8.45. The McCartneys are gone, so I'm just going to go nuts. The reins have been taken away. Put away, which implies to me effort. Do not do this anymore. Myself in the mirror of Scripture, my reflection is stop publicly. This is how I would, this is how I maybe have thought of it before. This Scripture, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Me looking at my reflection in light of a holy God, stop publicly doing most filthiness. Hide it like the rest of the Christians. Cloak wickedness in a bent against legalism and hang my hat on the grace of God because I believe his word. In other words, do things that I know aren't that bad, but I know they don't please the Lord, which is sin, and I explain away conviction under the guise of legalism. Did you guys follow that? How many of us go watch shows that we know we shouldn't watch, but we're grown men and we can do whatever we want? But they put thoughts in our mind, and pretty soon, a few days later, we're looking at things on the internet that we shouldn't. Christ died so you could be set free from that. Don't submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery. Don't fool yourself into thinking you can walk a line with sin and win. Christ died to defeat it. And you think you're going to walk in your flesh and sanctify yourself, straddle that line? It's foolish and it's pride. If you love God, you keep his commandments. He says that, not, it's not me. It's black and white. If you love him, you keep his commandments. It doesn't mean that you do it perfectly all the time. That's what's so good about our Lord is he knows that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for 
us, right? He's known me since eternity past. He knit me together in my mother's womb. I cannot surprise him with my actions. And that's what makes me love him even more. Because he loves me so much that he died for me, knowing that I would do what I would do and I would think the way I would think, and he's not surprised by it. So how foolish is it to, to come into contact with other people and look at them as if you are a judge or if you are Christ? I've said this many times, but we need to live in this place. If you're the woman at the well and the Lord meets you there, you don't leave like Christ. You leave the woman at the well who encountered the grace of God in Christ. (laughs) If his grace ever stopped, our salvation would stop right along with it. There's nothing we can do to sanctify ourselves. The grace of God is what saves us. And it saves us and saves us and saves us until we are glorified with him. Right? Amen, Cody. He gave me an an under the breath amen. That was good. Shout it. Mm -hmm. This is our nature. Um, Some of you guys know I like to fish. Um, See, what we like to do is compare ourselves to other people. Other Christians, we're not as bad as them over there, whatever. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty amazing at catching a bass. A lot of the people that I take fishing with me, I usually make sure they're like just getting started so they're just amazed at my abilities. And they're like, dude, you're literally the best fisherman I've ever seen in my life. And I'm like, I get that all the time. (laughs) But the truth is, if you were to put me up against the best fisherman in the world, I'd just be a guy, you know. And it's not that I'm so good at something, it's that they're they're not that good. So they're looking at me thinking I am awesome. And I think we do that with other Christians. We look at people and say, that's the standard, that's awesome, they're great. Or we look at other people and say, I'm not as bad as they are, so I feel a little bit better about myself. And what James is saying is, this is the standard. This is the mirror. Quit looking at everybody else around you and compare yourself to this. But the foundation has to be not in a way that you're going to beat yourself up or you're going to let the enemy come in and lie to you about how you fall short, but that you encounter the grace and mercy of God and it compels you to want to be like him. Right? Don't fall into the trap of comparing yourself as a Christian to the rest of the people in your church. So why do we put away filthiness and wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word? Because his word says so. But filthiness and wickedness are death. They are the old man. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me says, we receive the, with meekness the implanted word. I love this. When what Paul is saying in Galatians 2.20 there, when it becomes a reality to us, there is so much freedom there to not stand and defend ourselves, but with meekness stand on the word of God. What I mean is when you understand, when you come to the realization or have that encounter with the Lord and you in the secret place in your quiet time in his word and he reveals to you how wretched you were and how good he is. There is this, there is this just love for him and his word that, that takes place. I, I wish I could preach in a way that got you to that point, but it's a personal relationship with God. It's the spirit of the Lord revealing God in his word to you and how much he loves you. And when you encounter that, your life is then on a trajectory that only God can set for you. It's, it's not something that you can get here. You can be around it. Um, you, can, you can see other people walking in that. 
but you get your relationship by the power of the Holy Spirit alone with God. It's not your mother's relationship. It's not your grandma's. It's not your grand. It's, you got to get after the Lord yourself. And it's not this thing where you're wearing holes in the floor, you know, bruising your knees, praying day and night. It's just getting alone with God, taking your thoughts captive and letting the Lord speak to you in his word. It's a supernatural thing that takes place. And once that happens, you understand that God is holy and you're not, and then you see how much he loves you. And you just want to obey him and, and, and believe what he says. You believe that his word is true, and you walk in that. Um, he loved us and gave himself for us. So we receive with meekness the implanted word. I want to read just a definition of meekness to you. I think this is pretty cool. Meekness is an attribute of human nature and behavior. It has been defined several ways. Righteousness, humble, uh, righteous, humble, teachable, and patient under suffering, long-suffering, willing to follow gospel teachings, uh, an attribute of a true disciple. This is a, a Wikipedia definition as well. This isn't like out of, you know, a biblical dictionary. It says, meekness has been contrasted with humility as referring to behavior towards others, whereas humility refers to an attitude towards oneself. This is, this is the key, though. This is what I want us to hear. Meekness, meaning restraining one's own power so as to allow room for others. Meekness, meaning restraining one's power so as to allow room for others. The ultimate example of this is Jesus. I want to read John 19, 10, and 11 to you. So this is Jesus um, being turned over to Pilate. He is on his way to be crucified. And uh, Pilate is really not wanting to give him up for crucifixion. And he's, he's almost begging Jesus to let let him let him go. Say something to me. And Jesus is just not responding. And the, the people want him to be crucified. It's, it's a mess. Verse 10 says this. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you know that I have, the, do you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? This is, this is awesome. Jesus answered him. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Remember, meekness, restraining one's power to allow room for others. Jesus had total power and chose to give his life as a ransom for many. So look at this in the mirror of scripture. And this is painful for me. Christ died for me, and I'm going to walk around acting like I can even begin to be offended at anything. I give my life until offense arises, which is pride, which is often. I think I am owed things that I am not willing to show in those moments um, myself. Patience. I do what I don't want to be patient with someone who isn't patient with me. Kindness. I don't owe kindness to someone who isn't kind to me. I'm exhausted, so look out. I'm stressed. You have no idea how stressed I am. I am. Uh, I am this. My life is such. I am owed. I'm busy. We say a lot of things to ourselves or to other people. Jesus died for you. He spoke you into existence. Everything was made through and by him, and he gave himself for you. This isn't an extreme example. It is, it is the gospel. And the gospel levels the playing field for sinners. There is no level of sin that is worse than the other. We should all look at each other as someone that's been bought by the blood of Christ. We have no leg to stand on against each other. Jesus was the ultimate picture of meekness. And what I love about that, a way to look at it, is meekness 
is being completely confident in the truth and not defending yourself. Knowing you're right, but loving more than being right. Meekness doesn't defend itself because it knows it's not worthy to. Think about that for a minute. Meekness doesn't defend itself because it knows it's not worthy to. That just blows me away. God allowed himself to be killed by his creation while knowing exactly who he was. Meekness ratifies insecurity. It is so secure in the truth that it doesn't defend itself because it knows it's not worthy to be defended. My hope and my reality is in Christ. So you can do what you want. You can say what you want. We don't debate. We just walk in faith. We walk in complete meekness and humility because we have all been saved by the grace of God, right? So the last few words of that verse go on to say, with meekness receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. For me, the the truth of a holy and righteous Savior dying for someone like me is ultimately humbling. To the point where knowing I can't gain salvation any other way, I completely rest in his work of the cross. I have nothing to offer, so I have nothing to boast about. And this is ultimate freedom. It is. God wasn't offended by me, so I don't have the right to be offended by anyone else. In fact, Christ dying gave me the right to be called his son. Jesus didn't live at the expense of anyone. He never expected what someone didn't have to give, and he gave according to his standard, not the standard by which he received from others. Think about that. What if we treated people the way Christ treated us? I know these are like simple concepts, but how often do we really do them? You know? Especially with the people we love. Christ existed expecting nothing from the people he was going to die for. How much do I expect from my wife or from my kids? And I haven't even verbalize what I'm wanting or, or expecting or I just, I just have these expectations leveled on people. How hard are you to be around? Are you a high maintenance person? Is it difficult to spend time with you? When you get a phone call from somebody else and that name pops up, are you like, this is awesome. By that I mean it's not Awesome. Can't wait to have my life sucked out of me for the next 30 minutes about a pothole in the road or whatever, you know. I'm just saying. Thank God Jesus doesn't respond to us that way. But if this is a mirror, if he is the standard, then we look at that and say, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, your word is true, so I can be like this. And if this is what glorifies you, this is what I want to do. Help me to love without expectation, to love perfectly as you love me. Forgive me for not doing that. If the worship team would like to make its way back up. Yeah, no, I think we did good. We can have a long altar call or something. Christ was able to live that way because he knew the truth. It's helpful that he was the truth, but we have his word, and it is like a mirror. So we can see our lies in light of truth and walk in that truth. So again, don't study to learn, but study to change. Let the word file and sand and shape you. Let it be alive in you. Um, 
there's questions along with these studies, so I, I, I want to leave you with this. And I really do want you to consider, you know, doing this. Um, spend some time in prayer. Ask God to give you a heart for his word. Ask him to help you approach his word devotionally and obediently. Um, my prayer for us is that we see we at least lay hold of a little bit of an idea of the value that is the written word of God and what it means to us. This is not a book that we live around, that we write Bible studies out of, um, that we pull principles from and adapt them to the way that we live, but this is the model. This is the mirror. We've been given the Spirit of the Lord to obey this book, and it's for our good for his glory so that's what we want to do submit ourselves to the word of God if you guys would stand let's worship together for